What I'd like to do today is talk about Delavan Lake. It's a lake that's gone through some massive rehabilitation, very similar to a lot of lakes around here. But it's really all the things that have gone around here stuck into one lake. And I'll try to go through all of that. Um, this project actually started back in the 1970s. And because of that, it's gone through a whole series of different people that have worked with it. It's gone from federal, whoops, um, I didn't know what I was doing there. It's gone through federal groups, uh, state groups, and a lot of local groups. All those, had, all those people had a hand in this uh, rehabilitation. Now, we've heard uh, from various other speakers today, uh, one of the real problems in water quality uh, deals with excess nutrients coming into the system. And we see that in, God, if I ever get this thing down, we see this in small streams, small lakes, and a lot of the lakes that I work on are really big lakes, like uh, the Great Lakes. And you see these problems with algal blooms. And that's really caused by an um, excess input of nutrients. Now, most of the stuff you've heard here is dealing with nitrogen. The problem really in the United States, at least in the central part of the United States, is phosphorus. So I'll probably be primarily be talking about phosphorus, but it really uh, applies to both of those. Now, before I get into this, what I really want to do is go over some phrases, because you'll be hearing me talk about this all the way through the talk. And that is how we describe lakes. Now, we have a whole series of ty types of lakes, and it's really a gradation between those. But we really have three different types. We have oligotrophic lakes. So these are lakes that are fairly young, they're fairly clear, and they have a good, good fishery. Usually, these are the white lakes that you find trout in them. Then we have, as we get a little bit more eutrophic, we have mesotrophic lakes. These are the lakes that are a little bit more, um, have a little bit more weeds in them, a little bit different types of fish. And then finally, we have the eutrophic lakes. These are the lakes like, um, oh, these are lakes that have weeds along the shoreline, uh, a lot of rough fish, they have problems with the dissolved oxygen. Now, this whole process, as we go through here, you get eutrophic lakes. And then finally, I wanted to mention one that I think I heard people call it super eutrophic. We usually refer to those as hyper eutrophic. So we have a range of lakes. And this is a natural process as we go through here. Going with uh, time can lead to this process of going from a oligotrophic lake down to a eutrophic lake, or we have cultural eutrophication. That's caused by the excess of nutrients put into those systems. Now what we have uh, going about here and other plates across the country is we want to try to rehabilitate those lakes. We want to try to restore them to back from, if you're sitting on a lake that's re really eutrophic, boy, if I ever get that down, uh, real eutrophic, you want to try to get it back to oligotrophic. And there's a whole series of techniques that people have used to try to do that. Now, the lake I'm going to talk about today is Delavan Lake. Delavan Lake is found in the center part of the United States, fairly high. It's in the northern part of this, the, uh, the country. And it's a fairly moderate-sized lake. It's got a fetch of about, uh, three, or about six kilometers. It's got an area of about seven square kilometers. So it's a fairly large lake. Mean depth about 16 and a half meters, so it's fairly typical of lakes across uh, around this area. Now, through time, this is the watershed of Delavan Lake. Yellow is agriculture and red is urban areas. And it's probably pretty typical of a lot of lakes around here. Now, what happens is, is that through time, what we've got is a lot of nutrients coming in from all this agricultural fields and the city of Elkhorn up here. And originally, the sewage treatment plant there was dumping its effluent right into the stream, and you could see it would come down into the lake. Now, through time, that lake really got in, in bad shape. This is an algal bloom that occurred on the lake, and this isn't unusual at all. This is a really bad blue-green uh, blue algae bloom. And on top of that, the fishery, which used to be a fairly good fishery, a lot of game fish, turned into one dominated by carp. All right, come on. And bigmouth buffalo. Both of those are trash fish. Okay, I know they're, they're sort of unique. Some of those are unique to the United States, but they're really considered trash fish and not ones that people liked at all. And what they really wanted to do was to have a lake where you could sit around the shoreline, have sailboats going around. You could have people fishing in them, golfing on the side. They wouldn't stink. They really wanted a lake that was really fairly nice. So what they did is, um, at, 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 back in the early 1970s, this lake was really classified as one of the worst lakes in the state of Wisconsin. It was actually classified as the second worst state. And because of that, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency was going around looking at some of the worst lakes and trying to figure out well, what was causing these problems. And so what they did is they went out there and they really did a survey of the, of the area 
and found out, first of all, that phosphorus was the problem in this lake. Okay, nitrogen could be also at times, but phosphorus was really the dominant source. And then what they did is they went around to try to find out where all those nutrients were coming from. And what they found is that most of those were coming from point sources, not too unusual in the, in the 1970s. And then the rest of that was coming in from sort of the, ag the agricultural watershed, um, atmosphere, a few other little things. So because of that, what they did is they went out there and said, well, let's find out what, we know what that number one source is, that was a sewage treatment plant, so they, or it was a, a really lousy sewage treatment plant, so they put a whole new sewage treatment plant in, cost many millions of dollars, and then diverted all the water out of the watershed. So they thought they had it. This was, they, that last study showed that 76% was coming in from point sources, so they thought that by treating that, that they could um, solve the problem. Well, a few years after that, what they found out was that back comes the algae again. And in fact, as you can see, if you could read in here, you know, this is coming back, and some people, some kids were out there swimming, and they got sick. This is very often what you see in lakes with blue-green algae, and it was occurring here. Well, here this is after they stuck in millions of dollars into the area, and they're still having problems. So that's when the USGS, who I work for, got involved with it. And what we wanted to do is go out there and find out what was, what was really happening. So the first off, we started off by going out there and sampling the lake. We went out there and sampled three locations in the lake. And we've, what we try to do from that is try to reconstruct the phosphorus story, trying to figure out how that has that changed through time. And what we did is, this is our results over here, but we went out into the literature, tried to find out where it was all coming from and um, how it had changed through time. And we found out that this is total phosphorus and a problem level for total phosphorus is about 35 to 50 micrograms per liter. And we could see that it increased up here. And in the mid-70s, right before that sewage treatment plant was, what came in, it was way up over 200, which is an extremely high value for phosphorus. After the sewage treatment plant came in, you could see it drop, but it was still in, a, still in pretty bad shape. The other thing that we did is that we didn't want to just find out what the problem was. We wanted to figure out where the nutrients were coming from. And so what we did is we went out there and put in different sites around the watershed to try to figure out how many nutrients were coming in from the watershed. And this is one of our typical gauges. What we do is we, we put a gauging station next to a stream. And you can see that pipe coming in here. So what we're measuring is how much water is coming in and how much nutrients are getting to that lake. The other thing that we did in our study was not just to look for nutrients that were coming in from the watershed. We wanted to see how many were coming in from the bottom of the lake. And so what we see here is that this lake, this is the warm water sitting on top of the cool water. And phosphorus would start to come out from the bottom very similar to what we heard in, you know, you know, with Rotorua, with the elm treatment. And before that, we'd have a lot of phosphorus coming up from the bottom. And so we want to quantify that also. And those are the, the, the phosphorus that creeps up into the epilimnion. So the, based on our results, what we found out was this is the overall phosphorus uh, budget. This is where all the phosphorus is coming from. Now before, we had a whole lot coming from point sources. We eliminated all that. Now we've got a lot coming from the bottom. That was always there. It's just that it wasn't, nobody was worrying about it. So we got about 50% coming from the bottom, about 40% coming in from the watershed uh, from one inlet, another 10% coming in from the rest of the, the watershed, and a little bit from other sources. And we have a total loading of about 9,000 kilograms coming into the lake. So we still had about the same amount as that the EPA estimated, but what we have is a lot more coming from internal loading. So what we had is all this information, and now what we did is we went out there and we came up with a management plan, very similar to what's done for lakes around here. We wanted to try to go out here and come up and find out ways to reduce all that phosphorus loading so that we can improve the water quality of the lake. And in this case, what we did is we worked with the University of Wisconsin and some students went through there and they tried to come up with a way to fix everything. And so what they wanted to do in the, as part of that was first of all come up with very specific goals for this study. And the first one was to try to improve the water clarity. As you'll see this, this is going to be the same thing that people go through across, throughout the world in trying to rehabilitate lakes. They want to come up with goals. And that first one was to uh, come up with, improve the water clarity from one meter to a meter and a half. Now to do that, what we wanted to do is to find out how much of the, um, how could we reduce the, improve the water clarity? And that was to reduce the amount of algae in the lake. And to do that, we went through, came up with a couple models and looked at that and we said, we have to reduce that, the amount of chlorophyll from about 50 down to about 14. And in order to do that, we had to bring this, the spring phosphorus concentration down in the lake. 
And so we used another model, and that said we had to bring that, that spring concentration down from a 120 down to 34. And then finally, in order to get that phosphorus concentration down the lake, we had to reduce the phosphorus loading to the lake. And to do that, based on our models, we had to reduce that, that loading from 8,700 kilograms down to about 2,000. So you can see this is going to be a massive rehabilitation reduction in phosphorus. We had to reduce it by about 75%. The other thing was that we just didn't want to fix the chemistry. We wanted to fix the biology in the system. And this really shows the whole range of lakes out there that are out there, everything from that oligotrophic lake with trout in that, all the way out to this hyper or, or super eutrophic lake that's just loaded with trash fish. And so what the people wanted to do, they wanted to see that lake go from a hyper eutrophic system and slide back into that eutrophic. They wanted to have a lake that has a really good fishery out there, and they wanted, or, or they didn't want to have a, a, a rough fish fishery, they wanted to have their fish that were able to go out there, catch and eat them. So, how are we going to get that done? Well, to do that, this is at 8,700 kilograms, we have to reduce that down to 19, 1,900. That's 75% reduction. The only way they felt they could do that was get rid of that internal loading. Okay, they had to stop that completely and then reduce the, the external loading by another 75%. Now, this is massive, but that was the goal of this project, was try to reduce that down. So, in order to do that, they got all the people in the community together. This is a whole range of people. And we got the local support. This is the people that are around the area. They, they were able to, they, they wanted to go out there and help wherever they can. They put money into this, into this process. They had the state government involved. They were going to come out and help. We had the, this is the Wisconsin DNR. They were willing to put money in to re rehabilitate that fishery. They had the USGS, who I work with, coming in to try to do the science of a lot of this. They had the Department of Agriculture looking at trying to reduce non-point sources from the watershed. And finally, they had the, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which is probably the most important here. They were willing to put in as much as $7 million, but in order to do that, they really wanted to use this as a science tool. They wanted to see what are we doing here so that we can not only rehabilitate this lake, but maybe rehabilitate Rotorua. So they wanted to use this and learn as much as it from this lake as possible. In order to do this, um, they, they went through there. Now they had all the money. They went out and had this big kickoff celebration, a big party out on, on the end. If you can look over there, that's one of the, the um, U.S. representatives. He came over, had a big uh, speech, had a kickoff meeting. And after that, they really went after it. They were going to try to fix everything about that lake. The first one was convince all the farmers to change their practices. Going out there and saying, okay, we know what you're doing. Let's do it a little bit differently so we can reduce the amount of nutrients from the watershed. They told them to try to remove the tile drains. This would, would be very successful for, for nitrogen. Trying, they actually went out there and they pulled tile drains out of the system trying to reduce that amount of nutrients getting into the lake. They went out there, and if you looked at the watershed, here's Delavan Lake coming in, and here's the main tributary to the lake. They built wetlands. These three were just the streams coming into the lake down here, and they built these three wetlands to try to intercept all the nutrients coming in there and trap all, those, all the nutrients that, that they could. They knew the farmers couldn't do everything right away, so they wanted to trap the nutrients that they, they were getting by. The other thing they were going to do is short circuit it, try to short circuit it. If you, if you think about the lakes that were they're right out your back door here, um, that's sort of the shape that we have here. Here's the inlet and here's the outlet. And the idea was is to short circuit the nutrients will go right through the lake. To do that, they decided they, they thought they had to dredge a little bit, try to help the water along. Then they were going to build a diversion. You can see this is just like Rotoridi out there. And what they wanted to do is to build this. Now the problem with, with building this, this uh, diversion dam was that there was a big um, hotel right there, and they didn't think that was such a good idea. So what they did is they got this much, they, they could build a small one. Now all the scientists said this wasn't going to work, but they said this is all you're going to get, so they took it. So how are we going to do that? Well, this is the idea, this is the lake, here's the inlet coming in here, and they want to get it to the outlet. So in order to do that, first of all, they decided that it was going to be too expensive to dredge this lake out and build this. They're going to actually lower the water level down by about three meters before they started. So here they're pumping, they pump that water down by, by three meters. You can see it just trying to get all the water out that they could. After that, they brought, then they could, once the water was down, they could practically bring, bring in big machinery so they could, they could dredge the system. And here they are building the, that, that diversion across the lake. Now, it would have been really great if they could have built that thing all the way over to here, like some, like some lakes get the opportunity to do. Uh, this one, they can only build a small one. 
And what they were hoping then was that the water was going to follow that path. Yeah, you got the right idea. It's not going to follow that path. Okay, but that was the hope. Now, what they're going to do is, to try to help it along, they're going to try to make the dam go up and down when, the, when it rains. So that would sort of you get the water moving. And that was the hope, is that they get the water to, to go right along the, that, that side of the lake. So that was going to try to short-circuit it. Now, what, that would stop that, six, that 40% of my pie. How about all the nutrients that were coming up from the bottom? Well, instead of putting in these elm drippers that we have out, out, out the door here, what they decided to do is to go out in the middle of the lake and drop the elm out in the middle. And so this was going to go out there, trap the phosphorus, and, and, and basically seal the bottom of the lake. Okay. So this is what a sediment core looks like if you, if you pulled it out of the lake. And the idea was is that they were going to put a cap right on top of here so all the phosphorus, that was about 40-50% of that, was going to get trapped in the bottom and it wouldn't come back up. Okay. So that would fix the chemistry. How about the biology of the system? This is sort of how a typical mesotrophic lake works. We have a lot of big fish in here, which eat the, the smaller fish, which eat the, the bugs. This is the plankton in the lake, which will eat the, the, the phytoplankton, that's the little plants, the algae in the lake, which eats the nutrients. So that's a real balanced uh, food web, and that's what you really want to see. Well, that's not quite what this lake had. This is the, what, what Delavan Lake looked like. So Delavan Lake had lots and lots of big carp, very few of these, and because of that, we end up with very small zooplankton. Now, zooplankton aren't, small ones aren't that efficient at eating, eating uh, um, phytoplankton, and so we had a lot of algae in the lake given the amount of phosphorus in the system. So that's the way it was. Now, what they wanted to do to this was to get rid of those, those kind of fish, replace that with walleyes. That's the, the game fish of, of that area, who would eat the, the smaller fish, who would allow those zooplankton to get a lot bigger. So that was the hope here. And if they can do that, they can keep the algae down lower than what it should be, given the amount of phosphorus in the system. Okay? Now, the way that this works is that if you, if you looked inside of a fish's mouth, this is the gill rakers that you would see. So this is what we have right now, the planktivores. These are the ones that go out there, and they're basically big vacuum cleaners, and they, they filter out the system. And when they do that, they trap all those big zooplankton. And it's so only small ones get through. Now, on the other side, we got these bigger fish with big gill rakers, and both sides get through. But what happens is, is that the bigger zooplankton are more efficient, and that's what you'll end up with, the big ones surviving, because they're more efficient at, at eating. And if you have both of them going through, the big ones will all compete the small ones. So the goal here was to try to get the big zooplankton in the system. Okay. So how do you kill a million pounds of fish? This is roughly how many fish you have out there. So they're going to go out here, and now this is different than most lakes. These are all rough fish, and so people don't care about killing the fish. Well, they brought in rotenone. What rotenone does is it seals up the gills, and you can't, the oxygen doesn't go across them. So they brought it in by the tanker. They brought in so much rotenone into the system that they doubled the price on the world market. Okay? <laughs> now, so they brought it in, and they had staging areas. They brought this around, and they started to, to put all this rotenone into the system. They pumped it out, and you can see there's so many fish that this is just the water, this is the, the, the rotenone that spilled. You can see the fish are, are basically bubbling up already. Then they went out and they, they brought this across the entire lake to, to, to do this. And you can see these stripes. So they're going out. They're going to make sure that they get all, the, all these, these rough fish out. Okay. Well, they didn't quit there. They knew that if they, they just got the fish in the system, they wouldn't get all the ones upstream. So now they went up there, and every, every bridge crossing, they, they piled it in. Okay, you'd think that would be enough? No. They went up into the wetlands. They were going to make sure they got all the rough fish out of the system. Okay. So now they helicoptered this in, and now they, they tried to do it. After they were done, they went out, and now we had a, a ribbon of dead fish. Okay. So, but they got all the rough fish out of the system. Now, if, for, as a scientist, that would have been great if they would have had somebody go out there and scoop those all up, because that's a lot of nutrients in the system. But what they hoped was that they were just going to go down, sink to the bottom, and they'll take care of it in other ways, which is a mistake, but that's what they did. Okay. So, um, now that would have stopped them from, you know, everything upstream. This is actually downstream of there. Now, they, the lake was so low that there's no water leaving it. And so they put it uh, very similar to what we heard about before. They put this grate over the top so the fish couldn't get back into the system. So now, now they had all the carp out. Then they did send scuba divers out there, and they found no, no, more fish, no more fish at all in the system. So this is what happened after all of this. This is the phosphorus concentration coming through really high. 
It, now, they put the sewage treatment plant in here. If they'd given a little bit of time, they would have, they would have found out that they, that really did have a much bigger effect than they thought. But it kept coming down. And then you can see the control plant coming in, lake drawdown. Um, then uh, the rotenone was applied, or the, the rotenone was applied. They killed the fish. These are all the fish that were rotting. So that's a lot of phosphorus in the system. Then they applied the elm. And in, almost instantly, that lake became a swimming pool. It looked great. Everything was good now in terms of the chemistry. So what do you do next? You stock it with fish. So now we put all those walleyes, we put it, stocked walleyes into it and just a few fish for them to eat. And pretty soon what we had is a lot of walleyes in that system and they're all really skinny like cigars. <laughs> but this is, at, at this point, this was 1991, everybody was happy, it was a, a huge success and they had a swimming pool with basically starting the system over from scratch with a lot of fish in it. But that didn't stop Mother Nature. Mother Nature came in with one of the biggest floods in the Midwest in, in years. This is in 1993. It came in, and with that, it brought in a lot of nutrients into the lake. So only after two years, what we see is that the nutrient starts, concentration started to rise. Now, normally this would, have, you know, this would have been the end, but remember what I was saying is that there was supposed to be a test lake, and we went out there, and we wanted to understand what was going on. So we had gauging stations out there, and we could monitor the loads coming into the lake. And in fact, this is a gauging station. We knew it was going to be a long term, and so they built these things that looked really nice. <laughs> so this is the phosphorus loading into the system. What we see is this is the amount of kilograms coming through, and we wanted to keep it at 2,000 all the way through. We had a few that made it, but here right after we did the treatment, that was that big 1993. And basically what we think it did is it came in and flooded all that elm that we put into the system. So what happened is, because this was changing around, we wanted to look at each of those individual things and see how they worked. So first of all, we wanted to see if the wetlands were working. Here are those three wetlands I was talking about. And so what we did is we put in gauging stations above each one of those and below those to try to find out where those working. And these are just a mass balance. If you look at this, we have how much is coming in, how much is going out. And what we find is that those wetlands were working, but they were only stopped, whoops, but they're only stopping about 30% of the phosphorus coming in. And not, originally when people were looking at wetlands, they thought these were going to be really efficient. But as the studies came out, trying to stop phosphorus, a wetland of stopping about 30% was about all you could expect. So they, they were working like they were supposed to. The next thing we wanted to do was look a little bit downstream. Here's this inlet coming into the lake. And before we started, this was a really muddy system because the carp was, was turning it all up. After the, we got rid of the carp, all of a sudden the weeds started to grow, a lot of things happened, and this thing really changed. So what we wanted to do is to understand what was happening here. So to do that, here's an aerial photo of that, and you can see the weeds are just across it. So what we went into there is we wanted to do a, a really detailed study to find out what was happening in that inlet, because there's a lot of things that are really changed. And so what we did is a mass balance. Here's all the external sources coming in, the gauged area, the ungaged area, what's coming in from groundwater, what's coming in from the atmosphere. And then we also wanted to find out how that little inlet was working to see if that was helping or hurting the lake. So we looked at how much was coming in from the macrophytes, how much is coming out of the bottom, how much is deposited. We really wanted to do a detailed study here. And to do that, we worked with the Army Corps of Engineers. And what they did is they took sediment cores out of this lake, out of this little inlet, to try to find out what was happening. They took those sediment cores, brought them back into the laboratory, and, and looked at them and found out what was, where was the nutrients coming from, or what was there nutrients coming out of the bottom of those. And we really looked at those. Normally what you think is a lake goes anoxic or an inlet goes anoxic. When it runs out of oxygen, the phosphorus comes out. Well, we also did under pH. I didn't understand it why when we first started doing that. But then we'd go out there and we measured what was happening in the inlet. We measured the conditions on a daily basis or actually every 15 minutes. And so we could take that and, and combine that with our laboratory results to find out where the nutrients were coming from. And this is the results of that study. So we found out how much phosphorus was coming in to the inlet, and I'll just go through here and describe how it changed. First of all, we had carp in there, stirring everything up. We got rid of those carp, and the clarity got a lot better. As the clarity went up, we had macrophytes. Those are those plants in there, and those produce a lot of phosphorus all in itself. The plants increased the, the photosynthesis, which increased the pH. When the pH goes up, studies have found this was one of the first ones, but other, this one and other ones found it as pH goes up, so does the, then now the phosphorus will come out of the system, and this is where we get our oxic release. So now by removing the carp, which we thought was good, you can see all of a sudden we got a lot more phosphorus coming into the system, so we're learning about this. 
and then we had a little bit of anoxia. So although we got rid of the carp, which might help some places, it was not helping this inlet and was a really a big source of phosphorus. So if we look on an annual scale, this is just the seasonal scale. We can see this is the inlet. And the rest of the year is actually depositing phosphorus in there. So the phosphorus that was coming in every other time of the year it was depositing in this, in, into, the, in, into the mud of, this, of the inlet. But during the summertime, because of that increased photosynthesis and all those plants, it was pumping the nutrients back into the system. And that ended up being um, releasing about 30%. So all that gain, good gain we gained in the wetland, we lost it at the inlet. So now we're sort of at the, sort of uh, even. So then the last thing we want to do now is let's look at that short circuiting. Could that little diversion help us? Well, to look at that, this is, the, this is an aerial view of, the, of, the, of this lake. You can see how many, how many different boats are out there. Each one of those dots is another boat flying around. So what we wanted to do was to see where are we getting short circuiting across that lake. Now this is what, now I, I want you to watch the colors on this one. So if the water went straight across, we'd see that the color would be red. If it mixed into the middle, it would be blue. And so the question is, is if we measure the concentration leaving the lake, this black color, is it closer to the blue color or closer to the red color? So we did this for several years, and this is our results. Now remember, I wanted to, if we really, if this thing was working, we wanted this little black line to look like the red line. Well, here's the red line across, here's the blue line, and you can see basically there was very, there wasn't any short circuiting going on. So they built that peninsula and it really didn't do much of anything other than create a place for people to go fishing. Okay. So this is really what, the, this is what was happening. Well, how about that elm treatment? This is, we went out there, we, we buried the sediments so we can get rid of all of that, but we had that big flood with a lot of nutrients, a lot of sediment come into the system. And so what happens is, is that if we look at that, there's the phosphorus coming into the system. And when that happens, now this is before the elm treatment, this is a phosphorus concentration near the bottom of the lake. You can see it goes up all summer long. That's all the nutrients coming out of the bottom sediments and accumulating them in that bottom water. Okay, that's what we didn't want to see. So we wanted to go through here and I don't know, get rid of that. We wanted to shut that off. Now, if we shut that off, we shouldn't see that increase. So in 1991, that's exactly what it did. Now, that's before that, that big runoff event. So here, that's exactly what the so Elm was working. 92, it worked pretty good. 93, 94, we lost it. So even though we stuck in about $800,000 into the Elm treatment, because of all that external loading, because we didn't stop the nutrients coming in, now it's gone, we got internal loading happening again. So now we locked it, it's all coming back to us. Okay, so this is where we started off. It, I was using the, um, this is my base case of when we started in 1984. So once we added the point sources on, we're up to 143%. In 84 to 89, we're at 100%. This is where we wanted to be. We wanted to be right after that at about a 70% reduction, but it didn't work at least not in the short term. In the short term, we're right back to where we were. So all that work that we did in the watershed, it's not really working because of Mother Nature hurting us. Now that would have been a really short story. That would have been done, but there's other things happening here. And so if we look at this, what I'm showing here is the phosphorus concentration on top, the algae or the chlorophyll in the middle, and the secchi depth on the bottom. And here's our rehabilitation, and here's our goals. So. If we would have stopped and just looked at the nutrients, what we would have seen is that the phosphorus came back up and it was above what we wanted. But the chlorophyll was down and the water clarity was great. So all the people who were listening listen to me give talks, they're saying, you're nuts. Our lake is in great shape. They said, look, there's no algae in the lake. The water clarity is great. How can you tell me that my lake is bad? And I said, well, as long as you got the source of the problem, we're in trouble. So. What's happening there, and I'll try to show you what was happening, at least in the short term, is that instead of TLIs, you've heard people talk about that. In the US, we have something called TSIs, trophic state indices. And a 50 means above a 50 is a eutrophic lake, 50, 40 to 50 is a mesotrophic, and below 40 is an oligotrophic. So what we want to do is to bring that lake down to 50, which we did. If you see when the rehabilitation came in, we had that lake all the way to an oligotrophic stage. And that's when everybody was really uh, happy about that. But what we see now is those things start to differ. They're giving us different answers. The red line is saying we're in really trouble. That's the phosphorus. The chlorophyll and Secchi said, you're doing better than what you're hoping. So what's going on here? Come on. 
So we wanted to try to figure out what, why is that difference, and, and you probably got the drift because I was talking about that biomanipulation earlier. Well, that's exactly what, what's happening. I'll show you the data that we had to support that. This is where we were before the study started. This is where we were after. So what we got is we had a lot of those fish come in there, the big fish, they're eating the small fish, and we had those small zooplankton get to big zooplankton, and they would eat up the algae. And I'll show you the data that we had to support that. Here's the, the, the amount of big fish we had in the system before we had none. Then we had a lot of big fish. It's dropping, but on this scale of fish per acre, uh, sorry about the units, fish per acre, we wanted a value of two. We got a value of about 40. So we're doing really great with our fish. If we look at those, those zooplankton, those, those big and the small ones, what we wanted to do is we wanted to get rid of the small ones and get the big ones around. And so what we see is all the small ones here. This is time is going from 1984 to the rehabilitation and after. So here are the big ones. We didn't have many before. We had a lot of them after. The small zooplankton basically disappeared. So that's exactly what we're hoping to see. Well, what we were doing as part of this was monitoring the bottom of those wetlands and seeing how deep they were. And so here's the, this bottom line is where they were when we, right after they dredged them and made them. And we were monitoring those year after year after year. And so what we wanted to see those was filling in. Uh, it sounds bad, but the wetlands are getting shallower, but really what those were is detention ponds, and we wanted those to trap all the sediment and nutrients from the system. Now as we looked at that, here's the main, mean depth of those ponds. You can see it's dropping, which means they're getting shallower and shallower. Well, they started leveling off. Once you see a wetland depth leveling off, that means they've, they're not trapping much anymore. So as soon as we saw that, we said it's time to dredge. It took a few years to raise the money, but they did, and they dredged it in 2009. And so because of that, there's, they are stopping a lot of nutrients from getting down into the system. And this is just sort of showing you what they did is they end up redredging it. They did a little bit different design, but they're continuing to work in the watershed to try to trap those nutrients. Next thing we wanted to do is did the changes in the inlet affect that? This is where I was showing you where they went from a muddy system to a really uh, system full of plants. It really did change a lot, and it stayed that way. And what we did is we were measuring how much is produ produced in the system. So if this is zero, that means the water is just going through with no changes. If the water is above here, or I mean if this blue line is above there, that means that it's producing nutrients into the system. So I was showing that was about 30% when we were doing our study. You can see that's the 30% when we did it. But through time, if we looked at that number, if this is that, for some reason it's, it's no longer releasing those nutrients as much as it is. So it's pretty much the, the amount of nutrients coming into the system is the amount of nutrients leaving the system. So it's sort of reached an equilibrium, which is also good. That means that the wetlands are working and it's not bringing up a whole lot of uh, nutrients into the system downstream. How about that short circuiting? Uh, could it start to occur? Well, obviously I don't think it will. And so we wanted to compare colors again. I changed the color scheme a little bit. Now the question is, is that outlet concentration closer to the blue or closer to the red? We were hoping it would be closer to the red. But if you look at that, here's that green. It's really, it, it, it might be, looks like it's doing a little bit better. It's just because the phosphorus concentrations were up for a while. So really the water's just going right through the system. So the short circuiting is still not working. How about the internal loading? Well, if we added more years to it, what happens is, is that internal loading is gradually, it went up. And then it seems to be coming down a little bit. And I think that's because the, overall the nutrient loading from the watershed is changing. And so we're seeing that little bit of evolution in the sediments getting a little bit better. So they're not releasing quite as much phosphorus from the system. So where are we then? If we look at the, the overall mass of phosphorus is getting into the system. We're at before the study started. So there's our, our, our reference system, 100%. We dropped down. We, that was the goal was to get it down 75 Really, when I said it was 99, if we put a few more years into it, we found out there really was about a 10% reduction. And through time, we find out that we've got about a, somewhere around a, a 25 to 30% reduction overall. Well, I was showing the concentration dropped by about 50%, but now if we look at the loads and everything else, overall we got about a 30% reduction. So we're not where we want to be quite yet, but there's still a lot of efforts going in. If we look at those, the phosphorus, chlorophyll, and secchi in terms of our goals, well, if we looked at that phosphorus, we were above it, but through time we've gradually come down because of the changes in the watershed and the changes in those ponds. We've been able to maintain phosphorus right about where we wanted it. If we look at the, the chlorophyll, it sort of came back into an equilibrium. Originally it was better than we, what we expected, but now, now it's not quite there anymore. 
Now it's sort of bouncing around the goal. And if we look at Secchi depth, it's just gradually dropping. But now what we would expect to do is to see everything come together in terms of that trophic state index. And so these goals were all based on the same one, so we were expecting that the Secchi depth would gradually come down to that blue line anyhow. And so this is, if we look at that trophic state index, that's putting phosphorus, chlorophyll, and Secchi all in the same playing field. What we expect those three things to do is follow in unison. If it's working like a typical lake, when they separate, that means that something weird is happening, like a biomanipulation. So what we're seeing is that originally I was talking about those strong fish effects. That's because of the, even though we had a lot of phosphorus, the whole biomanipulation that was going in there was changing that system, and the lake was looking better than it should have. Although there's a lot of phosphorus, because of the fish eating, the, trickling its way down, we had better than what we expected. So what's happening out here? What we want to do is go back now as we understand the chemistry that's going on, but this lake is gradually coming back to a, sort of an equilibrium phase. So we think it has to do with that biomanipulation again. So this is where we were after we manipulated it. After, we, after, after that, what, what's happened is that we have seen carp come back into the system. A few people used them as bait and they got out of there and they, they came back in. Which, and also, as what, fishermen have been keeping these fish now, they got up to a size limit and they started taking those. So what happened is now that they're not eating the middle-sized fish and they got started to come in. And I'll just show you the results of that. Here's that, the, the, the big fish. Those are those walleyes. It came down, we wanted to keep it about two, but we actually even dropped somewhere below there. So we were not able to keep those fish. What I was trying to do is to keep the, the, the fishermen from keeping them. I wanted them to go out there, catch them, and release them so that they keep helping me. Well, that didn't happen. And you can see the population drop dramatically. But overall, the fishery is, is still a good fishery. It, it's not going back to the carpet, big mouth buffalo. It's something different, different. And this is a typical fishing magazine. It's saying it's a fishery on the move. If you look at what's in there now, before it was carp and big mouth buffalo trash fish. Now we got a full range of fish. We got everything from the walleyes. These are the big, these are these big walleyes, uh, large mouth bass, crappies. But we got these green ones. They, those are good for a fishery. They're not good for a biomanipulation. Now they're coming back into a sort of a typical lake. And so this is what the fishermen like to see. It's not what a scientist wants to see. I wanted to see that as, as clear as a lake we could, given what's out there. So um, if we look at it, what we had is now we had the fish. We're losing our big fish. I say in that biomanipulation, all we had was big fish. Now we got a moderate amount of those, but we had a lot of middle-sized fish. And so what we think is would happen is that that was causing a lot more smaller zooplankton, which would be less efficient at eating the nutrients. But we had happy fishermen out there. Not happy scientists, but happy fishermen. OK, so just to show you that that is sort of what, what uh, some of that is, is what, in fact, what happened. If we look at the large zooplankton, the medium-sized zooplankton, and then we got something down here. This is a different type of plankton out here. These are copepods. And what we see now, if you look at that and you go through, at first, we were losing our big zooplankton, and the middle ones, these small ones, started to come back. So it's sort of converting back to a typical lake, more like what we started with. But if we went a little bit further, we lost all those kind of, all these, they're called cladocerans. We lost all of those, and what we end up with a lot of copepods. So the, the, the biology is going through a, sort of a, an evolution through here. And as we went through this, at first they were really helping us. Here they were only helping us a little, and now we think we got to a phase where it's not helping us much at all, just acting like a typical lake. And so what we see is four phases. This is each one of those phases. We started off here, which is not what we wanted. We had a, sort of all these um, small zooplankton. Then we got to a phase where we had a lot of big zooplankton. Then we had that uh, hodgepodge of everything. And now what we're seeing is the copepods come in there. So we're seeing this evolution in the, in the zooplankton in the system. And with that, what we see is three phases in the algae in the system. If you look at this, this is bad, these are high. Then we went through this lull in here where all the algae was gone. And that's what we really wanted to see. But as you see over here, green came back moderately, but we see a lot of blue-green algae in the system. The, what it doesn't show in here is that the type of blue-green is not like it was. This, these were actually really bad blue-greens. These are bad, but not as bad. So, and so what we really see is three phases in the, in the algae. This is bad. We got into a good phase, and now we're sort of back into the bad phase. So 
that's where we are with the algae. But now what happens is the water gets clearer, things also change in the system. And with the lake being clearer and the, the sediments had a lot of nutrients in it, now we start to have a lot of macrophytes grow around. So we have a lot of plants around the periphery of the lake. A lot of people don't like that. The fishermen do because there's a lot of places for the fish to hide. But when we started this survey, we knew we were going to get plants. In fact, they bought two harvesters out here. So those harvesters were sitting on the shelf for a few years, but we knew that because the water was clear, a lot of nutrients, that the plants were going to grow, and they did. And they, they've, they've been harvesting like crazy ever since. We also have filamentous algae growing in there. And that's, uh, there's a reason for that, though. I'll show you that in a second. And that's these guys. Not only is that, but we had some other biomanipulations happening in here. We had zebra mussels come in. I'm not sure if zebra mussels are, are, are really common uh, down here in New Zealand, but we had zebra mussels come in. They basically come in, colonize the area, and there, you can see when we put piers in, they just completely clogged up everything, and what they do is they'd filter all the nutrients uh, as it's coming through and have a ribbon of, of really high nutrients around the outside, and because of that, blue-green algae and filamentous algae uh, grow a little bit uh, more efficiently. There, these things were growing in here so hard that the, this is a, a, a weed, that, a macrophyte growing up from the bottom. You can see all the zebra mussels going in there, and as the season went on, the zebra mussels would actually take the macrophytes, and they'd crash because they got too heavy. The other thing is that because of all those plants around the shoreline, the people did something. And what they did out, they, they tried to do some chemical control of the algae and the macrophytes. But originally, before our, our manipulation, they were sticking in um, algal sides out into the middle of the lake trying to bring down the nutrients or bring down the algae in the lake. After the study, you can always, it's pretty faint here, but the, what they were doing is those are all near shore plants and they're going out there uh, trying to get rid of those and so they were putting on poisons. And so what we end up with is some unplanned biomanipulations. We had a few carp coming back in, we had zebra mussels, and then we had algal sides. So really when we look at that whole system, we want to understand what's going on. We start off with strong fish effects, really helping us for about maybe seven or eight, nine years. Since then, we've had a moderate effect for a few years, and that was because of um, sort of an in-between fishery. We were going in there, the zebra mussels or the, uh, the plankton weren't the really changed. There were a lot of small ones, but there was really a hodgepodge. We had small ones, medium ones, and, and small ones. And now in the last few years, now we've had copepods come in. And as a result of that, when you look at the whole system, here we're out of, uh, out of equilibrium. Now we're still out, but not, well, not so bad. Now everything's telling us the same. And so really what happened is that we went through a long way to come back into equilibrium. This was, and all the, this whole period in between here is because of the, all the changes that we did to the fish and the, the, the fish affecting the, the, the zooplankton, which are affecting the phytoplankton. And we just gradually lost that effect. So um, in conclusion for this thing, if we look at the rehabilitation program, the overall rehabilitation, based on their original goals, was a success. They got down to where we were down there. It may have been 20 years later. But now, not only is the phosphorus there, but all, everything we look at is, is sort of where the goals were. Um, but the, the level of success really depends on which thing we look at. Phosphorus concentrations have dropped by about 50%. We wanted 75. We got a, a big chunk of that out of there, and they're continuing to work. If we look at the water clarity, it's coming down. But we knew it was going to come down. We couldn't stay so much better than, all, than what we'd expect, given the amount of nutrients we had in the system. But it's getting worse. And what I didn't talk about was the seasonality, and we are now having problems in late summer. If you look at the macrophytes and filamentous algae, well, we knew we were going to get some. A lot of people think they got a lot more than what they asked for, though. Um, if we look at the fish, now this really depends on which kind of fisherman you are. Um, if you're one going for the big fish, you're a little upset because they declined. But overall, the, it, it's, you see this, this uh, lake in a lot of fishing magazines, so it's pretty good. And finally, you need to fix the source of the problem, which is the phosphorus loading. Otherwise, any action is going to be a temporary fix. And what we saw is that, that although it was a temporary fix, it, it came down to their goal. So the, overall, it's been fairly successful. Now, like this lake, like many other lakes, they're not stopping there, though. They, got, they, they found that goal. Now they look at it and say, OK, we're sort of at an equilibrium, but we have a lot of problems in late summer. So they're looking off in the future, not just for them, but they're looking for their kids and what can they can do to, do to fix that lake. So what they're doing is they're looking at that, and they're worried. They had a really bad algal bloom a few years ago, and they're worried that this could be coming back. So they're wondering if the algal bloom that they had in 2007 is, is typical, or is, is that just a fluke? What about climate change? Is climate change going to cause problems? It's going to get, the lakes are going to get warmer. 
Is that going to cause problems? Um, there's always, like any other lake, they have development in the watershed. And they're trying to do that in the best way they can. In fact, they're thinking that by putting in more um, development, that'll take away a lot of the agriculture, and they can do this in a, a much more green way. So they're looking at ways to trap runoff before it gets into the lake. So they think that they can actually improve on the system. So that because of that, there's been a lot of talks. These are a lot of people that are running the system. And they're looking at it, how can they protect the lake? And one way that we've talked about is to take water out at different times of the year. This is the phosphorus concentration in the lake on a seasonal basis. And you can see it's really high right after fall overturn. Fall over and that's when all that water mixes back up. And what they're thinking is, is that maybe we can take the water out when it's the highest concentration. Another way is to, how about another elm treatment? So they wanted to go out there and they said, this is that $800,000 that it cost originally. Now they're saying it might cost $6, billion or $6 million to do that. So I don't want to get into this to detail. But what we're doing now is, is, is doing some um, real serious modeling, trying to say is if we got rid of that, that um, internal loading, shut that off, what would that do to the chlorophyll in the lake? And so what we're trying to do is to model that and try to find out is elm treatment really an, a, a treatment that will help, or will this external loading be enough to drive another algal bloom anyhow, and so it's a waste of time. And what I'm trying to do is to use the models that we have available to us to answer that question. The other thing is maybe a biomanipulation again. Okay, can, is there a way? Well, we tried it once, it worked, and I showed you it worked really well. Well, now we got game fish in the system. It's one thing to kill a million pounds of trash fish. It's another thing to kill a million pounds of game fish. And so that's not going to happen. So the overall, what we want to do is use scientific information to really guide this as we go into the future. And that's what they're looking for us and other scientists to go out there, try to find out and understand the system. And that's why when you look at the lakes around here, people want to know, they want to fix it, but we want to use all the information that we have in science to try to pick up and come up with the best ways to do that. Otherwise, with be back to like what I was showing you with that internal or that short circuiting. Our model said it wouldn't work. They wouldn't believe us. And it was just a waste of effort. So really what we want to do is use science wherever we can to really guide this, this, this effort. 